Okay, welcome. In this lecture, we're going to cover some basics of parallel processing. First, let's take a look at the required readings. Uh, these are some readings that I would strongly recommend you to do. Some of these will be reviews uh, that will be assigned to you. Uh, the first one is Hill, Juppi, and Sohi, uh, readings in computer architecture. There's a beginning of the chapter includes multiprocessors and multi-computers and their description. And this is a nice summary at the time it was written uh, of issues in multiprocessors. I would strongly recommend you to read this. The second one is the chapter on data flow and multithreading. And even though we're not going to cover data flow, and we're going to touch on multithreading just a little bit in this lecture, that's a good chapter to read. The second two uh, are important issues in multiprocessing today. They look into asymmetric multicore architectures, which we're going to look at in another lecture. Uh, the first one is a paper we did in NASPLOS 2009 on accelerating critical section execution in asymmetric multicore architectures. And the second one is another paper in NASPLOS 2012 that generalizes this approach. So hopefully you'll get a sense of some of the parallel bottlenecks that we will discuss in this lecture. And we will take a look at uh, in more detail in, the in one of the next lectures. There are a couple of recommended readings also. The Color Singh and Gupta paper, the first chapter, uh, provides you uh, information about what parallel computing is all about. And we're going to touch upon Mike Flynn's very high speed computing systems uh, paper that actually categorizes computing systems into four different categories that is still relatively useful today. Uh, there's a related video. This is actually on YouTube, and this, is, uh, this was recorded in spring 2013 uh, in my computer architecture class 447. It talks about multiprocessors, and some of the material in that video is similar to uh, this video. So you might want to watch that as well. Let's jump into parallel processing basics. Uh, Flynn, in 1966, wrote a paper that actually categorized computers into uh, a, a category of four different, uh, four different categories. This was called very high-speed computing systems. And I'd encourage you to read it. The paper is a little bit tough to read, but uh, let me summarize it basically. Basically, computers are divided into four uh, different uh, categories based on uh, instructions and data. And data. And instructions can be executed as a single stream or multiple streams, and data elements can be operated on as a single element or multiple elements. And uh, SISD is the processing paradigm where a single instruction operates on a single data element. This is basically an add instruction, for, for example, operate, uh, does operation on uh, a single data element or two uh, pieces of data element, but it's really a, a single add operation that happens uh, on the data element. So this is processing that we've seen before. This is the normal serial processing. Uh, you do not have any parallelism across the instructions. Of course, there are ex uh, parallelism exploitation techniques for single instruction, single data processors. There's also SIMD, where a single instruction itself actually operates on multiple data elements. This is where SIMD comes in. And in, in previ previously, we had seen array processors and vector processors in a previous course. Basically, when you do an add, that add doesn't only specify a single add, but uh, this, this is a SISD paradigm. Uh, a SIMD add, or a vector add, for example, specifies multiple of these adds done together. In this case, for example, you have five adds done together. It's a SIMD operation. And they all happen in parallel, or pipelined consecutively. Basically, SIMD, a single instruction, operates on multiple data elements. For example, if you're adding two vectors together, you really can do it in a SIMD fashion. A single instruction can add two vectors together. Whereas this is a scalar add, uh, if, if, you, if you would like to qualify it. Basically, if you would like to do it, uh, do, add two vectors with a vector processor, basically you can uh, use a single vector add instruction and set the ve vector length to the vector uh, length of the two uh, vectors. If you want to add two vectors uh, in a scalar processor or a SISD processor, basically you need to have a loop that executes many of these scalar operations. And we've seen this in 447, and we'll, we'll take a look at SIMD and GPUs later on. GPUs today are a version of the SIMD processors. Basically, they're a combination of array processing and vector processing. And I'd like you to uh, take a look at what the difference is between array processing and vector processing. We had covered that in an earlier lecture. But this is background reading for you. MISD, on the other end, you have multiple instructions operating on a single data element. That's where MISD comes in. This is the uh, this is a weird processing paradigm, actually. How do you have multiple instructions operating on a single data element? And it's not clear what kind of a processor this is. But the closest form is really a systolic array processor, which we have covered in 447, and which we're going to cover later on. Basically, you can have a single data element that's fed to instruction 1, that transforms it to something, that feeds it to instruction 2, 
that transforms it to something that feeds it to instruction tree, and then dot, dot, dot. This is basically a single data element, gets operated on by multiple instructions, and systolic array looks like this. A systolic array uh, processor that was developed by HT Kong uh, looks like this. And if you would like to take a look at systolic arrays early on, you can, you can either watch my lecture on YouTube uh, 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 that was recorded in spring 2013 and 447. The lecture is titled Systolic Arrays. You can search for that. Or you can actually read H.T. Uh, Kong's seminal paper, uh, which is basically Why Systolic Architectures. Uh, that's the title. <laughs> it's a nice title. Uh, and it's a beautiful paper that describes uh, how, how this operates. This is in, uh, I believe, IEEE Computer 1982. And you can take a look at that. But basically, this is the MISD processing paradigm. Multiple instructions operate on a single data element. But this is the closest form that I can think of. This is also called a streaming processor. And G current GPUs actually kind of operate uh, this way, so in streams or embedded systems operate this way. Uh, MIMD is the final form. Basically, you have multiple instructions operating on multiple data elements. But basically, you have multiple instruction streams. You have instruction one operating on data one, let's say and then instruction two operating on data two, and these are processed independently. This can be considered one instruction stream, and this can be considered another instruction stream. This is the multiprocessor, and this is what we're going to focus on in a lot, in a lot of this lecture. Or multi-threaded processor can also uh, be a part of the MIMD paradigm, because you can have multiple hardware contexts executing multiple instruction streams. So this is Flynn's taxonomy of computers. And when we talk about parallel processing, you can actually do parallel processing in all of these paradigms. Parallel processing is very general. Even though here you have multiple uh, single operations multiple, uh, oper uh, uh, operating on multiple data elements, you're doing parallel processing across data elements. Here you're doing parallel processing across instruction streams. You have multiple instruction streams operating on multiple data elements. Here you have kind of parallelism uh, within the pipeline, right? You have multiple instructions operating on single data elements, and the, at, at, at each point you can pump data in, pump different data elements in, and you can have parallelism across different data elements. At each point of the pipeline stage, if you will, or the systolic array, you have a different data element that's being operated on. And finally, the SysD, even though the architecturally this looks like you have one instruction and one data element, there's no parallelism, right? Microarchitecturally, you can extract parallelism out of it. You can actually pipeline the execution of different instructions in the SysD paradigm. You can do out of order execution. You can do uh, uh, other techniques like branch prediction that enable parallelism extraction from a SysD uh, architecture. So we have seen some of these concepts, and we're going to see a lot of parallel processing concepts. But I'd like you to think that parallel processing is actually quite a general uh, thing. Uh, and you can extract parallelism uh, out of architectures that do not seem to have a lot of parallelism, like SysD. OK, why do we have parallel computing? I've talked about extracting parallelism. What does parallelism mean to begin with? It means doing multiple things at a time. And things could be different things. It's exactly things, right? It could be instructions. It could be operations. It could be tasks. It could be threads, uh, dot, dot, dot. Uh, why do we want to do that? The main goal uh, of parallel processing has traditionally been to improve performance. Basically, if you have a task with many different uh, instructions, let's say, we would like to reduce the execution time of that. If you have many different tasks, we would like to maximize the throughput of those tasks, or we would like to minimize the latency. The main goal of do, uh, doing multiple things at a time is to improve performance. Of course, there's a caveat here that we will see. The execution time of a program is actually governed by Amdahl's law. If you cannot extract parallelism, the part that you cannot parallelize governs the execution time. One example, let's say you have a program that takes 100 time units. And the, 50, uh, uh, the portion of the program, half of the program, you can parallelize perfectly. The rest, you cannot parallelize at all. So the maximum speed up you can get by uh, extracting parallelism out of this program, let's say you have infinite number of resources. You parallelize the parallelizable part in those infinite number of resources. That's uh, the, per, uh, the execution time of that parallelizable part goes to zero, but the rest remains, the serial part remains. And the serial part is 50%, right? Which means that with infinite resources, the maximum speed up you can get is two, which is actually pretty scary, right? You put infinite resources and you get only 2x speed up. Well, that's Amdahl's law, and we're going to look at that later in this lecture. But if you can extract parallelism, that improves performance. There are actually other goals uh, of uh, parallel computing. And I'll cover some of these. One is reducing power consumption. In fact, this was uh, the reason multi-core got developed. Why do you reduce power consumption? 
Because if you can actually do things in parallel instead of serially, let me erase this part over here. If you can do things in parallel, what you can do is you can uh, have uh, these parallel execution units to execute more slowly and get the same performance. And that's what this uh, slide shows up here. The slide says, if, you, if you, you see that, let's say you have one big unit that can execute a program uh, at frequency f. Now, if you can partition your problem such that it can run on four small units and it can run in parallel, now you can run each of those small units at frequency f over 4. And you can get the same execution time, right? Because you've divided your program into four uh, uh, equal chunks. Uh, and uh, they've executed, they, 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 uh, each of the chunks execute 4x slower. But now, because you're exploiting that parallelism on those four processors, you get, you, you get your task done in time t. Here, you get your task done in time t also. So you keep the same performance, but you're more power efficient. Why are you more power efficient? Because these processors, there are several reasons. First, they're running at uh, smaller frequencies. And the second, they can be simpler, hopefully, right? Perhaps the microarchitecture is also simple over here, although we didn't talk about microarchitecture. But you can, you can imagine designing these processors to be simple, such that you achieve better performance. Uh, you, you, achieve, uh, um, you, you, you achieve less performance, but because you parallelized your program, now you can get similar, uh, similar performance overall. Uh, the, uh, well, if you look at the power, overall power, overall power is governed by uh, this equation, which is capacitance of your chip, uh, voltage square frequency, CV square F. This is actually how your power uh, uh, is consumed, power is correlated with. And there's an activity factor as well. Now, uh, what happens is, if you reduce your frequency by 4, you get savings in frequency. right? And actually, if you can, uh, to be able to run these processors at a higher frequency, you, need, you normally need to ramp up the voltage, have higher voltage. So if you reduce your frequency by 4, you don't need the voltage to be as high, so you can actually divide voltage by 4 as well. So what happens to power by uh, doing this, exploiting parallelism, is you get a quadratic reduction in power itself. So power basically becomes alpha C V F V, uh, v square F divided by 64 in this case. So that's the beauty of uh, exploiting parallels. The caveat is, in order to keep the same performance, you need to be able to parallelize your program perfectly. And remember that perfectly. That perfectly may not always happen because there is a serial part of the program. So you can actually reduce power consumption uh, this way by exploiting parallelism. And this is one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, benefits cited by moving to multi-core. Basically, in a single-core system, you need to build this processor that can be really fast. In a multi-core system. You don't need to build each processor to be very fast. As long as a programmer can parallelize their program, you can get the same performance at much lower power. But keep that in mind, the caveat in mind. The caveat is as long as the programmer can parallelize the program perfectly. OK, there are other goals of actually uh, doing parallel processing. Uh, well, I, I've already covered why. Improving cost efficiency, scalability, and reducing complexity. Basically, I've already shown that here. It's harder to design this unit that performs as well as n simpler units. It's harder to design one single unit that operates at a performance, maybe frequency is not the best thing over here, let's say performance p, versus four smaller units that operate off at performance p over 4 for a given unit of performance. Right? It's easier to design this unit, which means that you can make the system more scalable. You can uh, you can stamp out more of these smaller processors in place of this huge, humongous processor that's very hard to design. And that's another benefit of multi-core. Going from single core to multi-core, the benefit is could be energy efficiency. You become more efficient. And you become simpler, which leads to ho hopefully lower cost and more scalability. The downside, again, is you need to be able to parallelize your program perfectly to actually get those perfect benefits, keep the same performance while getting the benefits of power and simplicity. 
Finally, there's one more reason why we do parallel computing, and this is actually improving dependability. Uh, this is a reason that doesn't come to mind easily, uh, usually when I ask this question, when I teach this course. But basically, if uh, the one reason to do parallel computing is uh, having multiple units execute the same program, right? You execute program, and you execute program's copy, P prime, the same copy. And then you can compare the results of every single instruction when you do this. And that's the idea of lockstep execution. Lockstep execution is one form of uh, redundancy where you execute the program, two copies of the program in parallel in redundant execution units. This is a form of redundant execution. Uh, and you compare the results of every single instruction one by one before committing an instruction to, uh, to the architectural state. And this enables better reliability. And the hope is that uh, you will find uh, the bugs. Uh, you, you, you will find the errors that may happen. Why uh, one, one of the processors may be buggy, for example. One of the processors may, may get a particle strike. So let's cover some of the errors. And this is redundant execution in space. This enables better dependability. You can also do parallel uh, processing in time. And if you want to do redundant execution in time, you can actually use the same units and execute one copy of the program first, and then another copy of the program next, and maybe with some lag between the instructions. And before committing a single instruction, you check whether the results of the first executed copy actually matches the result of the second executed copy. And uh, if, if time permits, we'll see that. This is called redundant multi-threading. And I'll provide you some papers related to this. Uh, uh, but uh, what, what one of the papers that I would recommend is by Reinhardt and Mukherjee uh, that's, that appeared in ISCA uh, 2000 that introduced the idea of redundant multi-threading or Eric Rottenberg in uh, Fault Tolerant Computing Systems Symposium in 1999 uh, he called it ARSMT basically advanced and redundant SMT, simultaneous multi-threading, where one thread runs ahead, uh, executes ahead, and the second thread follows behind. And before committing an instruction, you check whether both threads actually produce the same result. So this can enable some dependability. And there are many other techniques that use this sort of parallelism uh, to, uh, to improve dependability. So keep this in mind. There are many goals of parallel computing, but the main goal is actually to improve performance. So there are different types of parallelism as well. And uh, uh, these parallelisms are exploited in different ways. Instruction, data, and task level parallelism. Instruction level parallelism you're already familiar with. Basically, different instructions within a stream can be executed in parallel. And there are many techniques that have been developed for this. Pipelining, out-of-order execution, speculative execution methods, a VLIW execution model, or decoupled access execute execution model. These basically aim to execute it. Uh, instruction within a stream in parallel. Out of order execution, for example, looks ahead into the instruction stream to find independent instructions that can be executed with this long latency instruction so that the latencies can be overlapped. A data flow model where instructions fire when their inputs are ready uh, is another model that is, exploits instruction level parallels. And we will look at some of these models and we've looked at some of them in 447. Data parallelism is another type of parallelism where you have different pieces of data that can be operated in parallel. This is the SIMD, single instruction multiple data parallelism. Vector processing or array processing is an example of this. In a, for example, when you're doing a matrix, uh, uh, when you're adding two matrices, this is very parallel, right? You can actually have all of the data elements, uh, all of the uh, additions done in parallel with a single instruction. Systolic arrays and streaming processors are also exploit data parallelism because they exploit parallelism in the data. In a systolic array, you pump data elements into the array, and they get uh, processed as a, a, in a streaming manner. Finally, task level parallelism. In this case, different tasks or threads, uh, basically units of instructions, can be executed in parallel. And task level parallelism is exploited by multi-threading processors and multi-processors, uh, like multi-core processors. And we'll take a look, at, look a lot into task level parallelism uh, in the next few lectures. So one question in task level parallelism is how do you actually create the tasks? And there, there are two major ways of doing, creating these tasks. First, you could be concerned about a single problem. 
And you can partition that single problem into multiple related or cooperating tasks. Uh, these are usually called threads. Threads actually share some memory space with each other. Uh, you can do this explicitly. There are two ways of doing this. You can do this explicitly, and this is uh, what leads to parallel programming. Uh, basically, a programmer figures out and partitions uh, a, a single problem solution into related tasks. Now, this is easy when the tasks are natural in the problem. Right? For example, uh, you, may, you may build a database, and the queries that are coming to the database are extremely parallel. So in this case, you can exploit the parallelism that happens across these queries. Now, the queries are actually the tasks. But, if you, but it, it's difficult when the natural task boundaries are unclear. For example, you have a single query. How do you parallelize it within your database now? And I'd like you to think about that. Uh, and because you, could, you can actually come up with uh, potential solutions and research projects as well. Uh, there's another way of actually extracting uh, multiple related tasks from a single problem. And you could do this transparently or implicitly. And this uh, leads to ideas like thread level speculation. Basically, you can partition a single thread speculatively. How could this be possible? For example, you may be executing in single threaded mode. And uh, you get to a function call. And that function call uh, can, can be a point where you divide the execution into two threads. The, one of the processors that you have can execute the function. And the other processor that you have, it can jump to the return of the function and can keep executing speculatively. Maybe it predicts the values that are produced by the function. This is called speculative execution. Now, uh, if the function is actually independent of, uh, if the return of the function, the point you return the code is actually independent of the function itself, you gain a lot in this case. And the programmer didn't need to parallelize this implicitly, right? You can actually use value prediction, predict the values that go into the input of the, uh, uh, of the return point in the function and uh, speculatively parallelize with better accuracy. And we'll see approaches to do this. This is called thread level speculation. The second uh, way of creating tasks is t uh, or generating task level parallelism is to run many independent tasks or processes together. And in this case, basically, you're not dividing a single problem, but you're somehow collecting many independent tasks. This is easy when there are many processes, right? If you're doing batch simulations, for example, uh, you, you're running many copies of your simulator on different benchmarks, for example, if you're doing computer architecture evaluation. If you have different users that are multitasking, uh, or if you have cloud computing workloads, where uh, if, if you're Amazon, for example, and uh, everybody sends their workload to you to execute, gets time on your computers, now you have many independent tasks to run on these processors that are parallel, so that you can keep those processors busy. The, the difficulty, uh, the, the caveat here is of, it, of course, doesn't help the, the performance of a single task. So these are two different kinds of parallelism. One, one is uh, partitioning a single problem, and the other is actually running multiple problems or multiple tasks together. Let's go into multiprocessing fundamentals a little bit after, uh, now that we've talked about parallel processing basics. There are two multiprocessor types. One is loosely coupled multiprocessors, and the second is tightly coupled multiprocessors. And the key distinction between loosely coupled and tightly coupled is the existence or the lack of a shared global memory address space. In a loosely coupled multiprocessor, there is no shared uh, global memory address space between the processors. And in a tightly coupled multiprocessor, there is a shared global memory address space. Uh, basically, the operations, every processor sees the same memory address space. And uh, as a result of this, uh, a loosely coupled multiprocessor is actually like a multi-computer network. It's a network-based multiprocessor. If you think of a loosely coupled multiprocessor, basically, let's say you have um, four processors. And these processors have their own private memories private address spaces, address space through 0 through, let's say, m minus 1, 0 through m minus 1, 0 through m minus 1, 0 through m minus 1. This processor cannot reference this memory. It has to somehow send a message to this memory. Whereas each, this processor can only reference its own memory. Whereas a tightly coupled, in this case, these processors uh, actually share uh, the memory address space. You basically have shared memory. Maybe you have actually 0 to 4m, right? It's 4m minus 1. That's basically the shared memory address space. Every processor can uh, reference every other's memory. In another way, uh, so the hardware doesn't need to be 
uh, difference in these processors. The hardware can be the same. It's really a logical uh, ability to reference each other's memory. You have 0 through 4, uh, m minus 1 address can be distributed here, and then m through 2m minus 1 can be here, and then 2m through 3m minus 1 can be here, the addresses, and 3m through 4m minus 1 addresses can be here. Now, if a processor says address 0, everybody knows that the address 0 resides over here. So these processors actually, this is the traditional multiprocessing, symmetric multiprocessing. Existing multi-core processors are this way. multi threaded processors are this way. You have a single shared address space. Now, uh, because uh, th this actually determines your programming uh, model a little bit, although you could actually uh, decouple the programming model from this, but basically, uh, loosely coupled multiprocessors are usually uh, programmed using message passing because uh, this processor cannot say load value zero from this processor directly, right? A load actually always is limited to the address space of its own. What this processor needs to do is it needs to send a message to processor three and get the data at a particular location. So there needs to be an interface to enable this, and that's the message passing interface. There needs to be explicit calls send and receive for communication here. Whereas here, the programming model is very similar to uh, uniprocessors. Why? Because this processor can easily access this other processor, uh, the, uh, any memory. Every processor sees the same memory. If you see load, address, load from address 3M, you get it. If this processor says load from address 2M plus 2, it gets it. Basically, it's, uh, the uh, programming model doesn't change. You still have loads and stores. The difference over here is, now, operations on shared data require synchronization. If both processors need to access uh, 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 the same memory location, let's say 2M, they need to somehow synchronize. The programmer needs to ensure that that is synchronized. Here, the programmer needs to ensure that sends and receives are sent, uh, inserted correctly, such that communication is done correctly. So uh, these are two different multiprocessor types, and they lead to different programming models, which we will discuss in a later lecture. There, Let's focus on the tightly coupled multiprocessing a little bit. Uh, this is the major form of multiprocessing today. Multi-thread processors as well as uh, multiprocessors have single global address space. Uh, because you have shared memory, now operations on shared data require synchronization. Let's say you have a linked list and you have two processors, two threads running, uh, two threads running on two different processors. One is trying to add an element to the linked list and the other is trying to remove an element to the linked list. Remove the same element where, uh, uh, remove, the, uh, remove from the position where the element is supposed to be added, let's say. You've got to protect this, right? Because there's a lot of shared data. This linked list, this entire linked list is shared between the two processors. And when one is adding, the other should not be deleting an element. So this requires a synchronization between the two processors. Locks, atomic operations, and other synchronization constructs need to be supported. And we'll take a look at that in, in, in a few lectures soon. Uh, uh, cache consistency or cache coherence, more commonly called, becomes an issue because if, you, if the processors actually have private caches, that cache portions of the shared global memory address space, now what you, can happen is a location, let's say location M, can be cached in multiple processors' caches. And when this processor updates this location, it stores to this location M, this processor may not be aware of it. So you need to keep that consistent because otherwise this processor may read stale data uh, while this processor is silently updating uh, the data uh, in its own cache. So cache coherence becomes a problem with the tightly coupled uh, multiprocessor. Whereas it's actually not a problem over here uh, in the message passing uh, processors. Uh, ordering of memory operations becomes a problem. What should the programmer expect that the hardware provide? What kind of ordering of memory operations should, should these different cores see? And we'll take a look at that. And this is called the memory consistency problem or memory ordering problem. There are other issues that happen. Resource sharing, contention, and partitioning. Because there's shared memory, how do you actually access that shared memory? And how do you actually solve the contention problems? How do you actually partition data across potentially distributed shared memory ma machines? Communication becomes an issue, and this is actually an issue in message passing machines also. Resource sharing, all of those issues are also in message passing machines or loosely coupled multiprocessors. How do you design the interconnect to actually interconnect these caches, interconnect these memories, and also interconnect uh, the processors to the memories? And finally, load imbalance becomes a problem, and we'll take a look at that also. How do you actually partition your problem such that your load is balanced across different processors? 
So just as an aside, uh, you can actually have tightly coupled multiprocessing within a chip. And the idea is you have a single core, single processor. But you can have multiple hardware contexts, right? So you can have hardware context one, hardware context two. In this case, you can execute from multiple threads at the same time. And the hardware itself controls the switching between the threads. You can perhaps switch every cycle. Or you can execute concurrently from different threads at the same time. There are many forms of this. Basically, the idea of hardware-based multi-threading is having multiple hardware contexts. You could do it in a coarse-grained fashion. You could do it in a fine-grained fashion. And you could execute these threads in a simultaneous fashion. Coarse-grained fashion means you may have multiple hardware contexts, but hardware chooses to execute this thread for a quantum and this thread for a quantum. And then it, it basically has a policy that alternates. Basically, you can have a hardware-based thread scheduler. And the benefit of this is, because the operating system takes uh, much longer, on the order of milliseconds, to schedule threads, you can provide a much more finer-grained uh, parallelism in the hardware by taking instructions from different threads. And you can actually increase the number of contexts such that you can keep the functional units that you have busy. Uh, and coarse-grained uh, multi-threading uh, enables that. For example, another, another approach to coarse-grained multi-threading is when a thread gets a cache miss, it has a long latency cache miss that takes 100 cycles, now the hardware can actually start fetching from this other thread uh, that doesn't have a cache miss. That way, it can tolerate the latency of the cache miss. Hardware still becomes utilized, keeps, uh, keeps uh, being utilized, and you can improve the throughput of the machine. Whereas if you had a single-threaded processor, if it got a cache miss that took 100 cycles, 100 processor cycles to service, you wouldn't have another context to switch to. And if you go to the operating system to switch to some other context, it would take much more than 100 cycles to do that context switch. So you normally stall for that 100 cycles or do some out of order execution, something else for that particular thread. But multi-threading enables this latency tolerance and higher throughput by executing instructions from a different thread while uh, a thread is stalled for some amount of time. So it could be event-based, it could be quantum-based. Fine-grained multi-threading, uh, and if, uh, we'll actually cover multi-threading later on, but just to uh, give you a head, heads up, uh, uh, the, the April processor uh, that was uh, built by Anant Agarwal uh, in ISCA 1990, published in ISCA 1990, talks about this coarse-grained multi-threading approach, switch on event multi-threading. And there have been machines that are designed that do switch on event multi-threading. Itanium uh, is one example, for, ex uh, for example. Fine-grained multi-threading can also be fine-grained. And the idea here is cycle by cycle. Every cycle, the processor fetches from another thread. And this is a very old concept. It was first introduced by uh, the CDC 6600, Control Data Corporation. Uh, that was a very small company that competed with IBM at the same time in the design of a supercomputer. And it's also uh, clear, uh, crisply explained by Burton Smith uh, in his seminal paper I, uh, that was published in the International Conference on uh, Parallel Processing in 1978, a pipeline shared resource MIMD computer. Basically, it's just an MIMD. It's multi-threading. Right? And the idea is, basically, you have uh, some pipeline stages. And if you want to keep the pipeline full, fetch from a different thread every other cycle. Now, this enables many benefits. For example, you can, you can eliminate any data dependency checking logic within a thread, because you never have more than one instruction from the same thread in the pipeline at any given point in time. You don't need to do branch prediction to improve the performance of a single thread. Because again, you never need to fetch another instruction from that thread in the pipeline at the same time before a branch is resolved. Uh, so this uh, simplifies the hardware. And if you have lots of threads, this can enable you to get high throughput. Finally, simultaneous multi-threading. The difference in simultaneous multi-threading from these diff two different uh, threading paradigms is now you can actually execute instructions from different thread and different functional units. Let's say you have functional unit 0, functional unit 1. Uh, in, uh, in simultaneous multi-threading, functional unit 0 can be executing instructions from thread 0. Functional unit 1 can be executing instructions from thread 1. And they could be concurrently scheduled. And we will see that this is actually employed in uh, many existing processors as well. This is good for improving the utilization of multiple execution units. Whereas if you have uh, fine-grained multi-threading, you don't have this, basically. If you, if you have fine-grained multi-threading, and if a thread has only one instruction to execute, the second functional unit goes empty. So you don't uh, get the benefit of functional unit utilization. But 
uh, simultaneous multi threading enables that functionally to be utilized by scheduling an operation from another thread. So, of course, this requires higher hardware cost because now you need to be able to schedule from different threads at the same time. But it turns out existing out of order processors can do this relatively easily with some additions uh, to uh, their hardware. Anyway, I digress a little bit on hardware based multi threading, but that's an exciting concept, and I'd like you to think about doing projects uh, potentially on this topic because they're very exciting. Uh, projects that could potentially happen. One interesting project is actually how do you design uh, a processor that can have that can support thousands of threads, for example, very efficiently. So let's say you have only four contexts, but you would like to be able to support thousands of contexts at the same time. How do you achieve that? How do you get the benefits of uh, uh, doing a thousand-way multi-threading while having only storage for four uh, four way uh, four contexts and this is an interesting project and if you're interested uh, I'd be happy to talk about it with you okay let's jump to another topic which is the metrics of multiprocessing uh, I will go through this relatively fast uh, you can read uh, about this more but first thing first uh, which uh, I'd like to uh, jog your uh, brain a little bit and I'd like you to do this exercise while you're actually watching this uh, and perhaps you can stop your video to think about this a little bit uh, but let, we're going to take a look at parallel speedup, and we're going to let, take a look at a particular example in parallel speedup, uh, which is this particular. Let me put it up. Oh wait, I guess before we go into that example, let me define parallel speedup. But we're going to go into that example soon. Uh, the definition is basically how, uh, speed up is how much uh, how much does the program uh, you're, you're, you care about speed up when you execute it with m processors compared to when you execute it with one processor, and that's how the speed up is defined. Let's take a look at this example that I promised you, uh, which is this polynomial over here, uh, which is actually a4 x to the 4 plus a3 uh, x to the power of 3 plus a2 x to the power of 2 plus a1 x to the power of 1 plus, and I believe I have an a0, I hope. Yes, there you go. And this is the constant. The a's are constants, and x's are basically uh, some values. They're all uh, input values. And this is a polynomial. And let's say we're going to evaluate this polynomial. Uh, assume each operation can take one cycle. And remember, we have lots of operations here. This is an addition. This is a multiplication. And power is also a multiplication. And assume there is no communication cost. Assume that each operation can be executed on a different processor. Basically, a different processor uh, can, can, can either do an add or a multiply. And there is no communication cost. Uh, how fast is this code with a single processor? I'd like you to take a look at that first. How fast uh, it, it can this run? How many cycles does it take? And assume no pipelining, assume no concurrent execution of instructions. In a single cycle, the processor can execute only one instruction. That's the first question. And the second question that I would like you to uh, do while you're watching this lecture uh, is how fast is this with three processors? And with three processors, oh, I shouldn't give you the answer. Assume that each operation, again, one, takes one cycle in a processor. There's no communication cost. So if you actually do uh, this multiplication in one processor and then uh, do this addition uh, in another processor, basically you can actually do that with zero communication cost. We're going to be ideal here. And we're going to take a look at uh, something interesting over here. OK? Uh, so take, take a little bit of time and uh, do, this, uh, do this calculation yourself. Basically try to figure out uh, the answer to these questions. And uh, I, will, uh, I will be back in a second uh, while you're taking a look at that. Uh, I'll take a break and... Uh... Okay, now that we're back, let's take a look at the answer to the question. How fast is this with a single processor? So this, uh, this over, uh, over here on the slide, I show uh, how long it takes uh, with a single processor. 11 cycles, right? Why? Because we have 11 operations. You basically do the uh, x's uh, on the side. Uh, let's take a look at it over here. Uh, you basically do the uh, oh, calculation of the x's over here. And then you feed uh, to a1, a2, a3, a3, x3 is here, a2, x2 is here, a1, x1 is here, a0 is here. And you do, a, you do an addition chain over here. This is the multiplication part, and this is the addition part. It takes 11 cycles with a single processor, right? Basically, T1 is 11 cycles with some algorithm. And that's the data flow graph. 
for this, right? Uh, the, how, do you, how do you get that? This is the data flow graph uh, that's shown in the slide over here. What about the three processors? Well, with three processors, you can actually do it in five cycles, and you can study this uh, graph over here on your own. You can print the slides. I would recommend doing so. Basically, uh, with three processors, you can do this in five cycles, which means that time taken with three processors is five cycles. So what is the speed up in that case? The speed up is basically 2.2. Speed up T1 divided by T3 equals 2.2. With three processors, you get 2.2 speed up. Not bad, huh? Uh, that's actually nice, but is this a fair comparison? How many of you actually got uh, 11 cycles for T1? Well, if you actually uh, were careful, if you were uh, just optimizing this, you shouldn't get 11 cycles. You should really get eight cycles. And here's why. Because you can refactor this multiplication. Instead of drawing the data flow graph directly, you can refactor x's out of this polynomial and design a much shorter, much better single processor algorithm. And the idea of refactoring is actually Horner's method or Horner's rule. Uh, and you may have learned this in high school. Uh, basically, you take out x and you keep refactoring x. And what you get in the end is the equation uh, that I show over here uh, for you with Horner's method. And Horner's method is actually explained in this uh, beautiful publication that was in 1819, a new method of solving numerical equations of all orders by continuous approximation. If you're interested in that, you can take a look at that. So now that you've, uh, you've factored out x's, and this is the way you would do it, actually, uh, plus x. Uh, I guess I didn't do uh, a good job over here, but let's do this, actually. Yes, this is better, right? OK, uh, Na2. And then you can do plus, uh, I believe, another x over here. Uh, let's see, a3. And then plus, oh, this, is a, this is kind of a nice way of actually extracting out x's, right? Although I didn't uh, do a good job over here. a4x, there you go. Yeah, a4x plus a3. And then you basically do this refactoring. And that's what you get in the end, Horner's method. So how long does this take? Well, Horner's method leads you to a beautiful graph kind of like a data flow graph. Well, I guess we should add a0 over here, which is basically an alternation of uh, multiplications and additions. You, f you get a4x here, and then you add a3, and then you multiply it by x again, and then you add a2, and then you multiply it by x again, and you add a1, and then multiply it by x again, and then you add a0. With a single processor, this takes now no more 11 cycles, but now you have eight cycles to execute this program. Well, this is much better, right? So what is your speed up? It's no more 2.2. If you have used this algorithm in your single processor, it would have been 1.6. So with three processors, you get a speed up of 1.6, not 2.2. So the previous comparison we did was not a fair comparison, because we didn't use the best possible algorithm to solve the problem that we're solving. And this is something to be very careful about. If you would like to get a good speed up number with the parallelization, then you should really use the best possible algorithm on a single processor. And you should also use the best possible algorithm that you know of on n processors. And that's the way you can get the uh, fair speed up. So the takeaway is that you need to use the best known algorithm for each system with n processors. If not, you can actually get super linear speed up. Now, in this case, we didn't get super linear speed up. Uh, the speed up was 2.2 with three processors. The speed up did not exceed three. What is superlinear speed up? Basically, if the speed up is greater than p with p processing elements, that's superlinear speed up. Basically, that it looks like this. Instead of a linear curve, you base, your speed up is basically above the linear region. Uh, typical success is actually sublinear. So this is number of processors over here. As you add processors, and this is the speed up compared to a single processor. This, uh, 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 this is called a speed up curve in parallel processing. Basically, linear speed up means as you add processors, you keep getting the speed up. Basically, it's a x equals y curve, right? Normally, the typical success is as you add more processors, you get diminishing returns. And superlinear speed up could be something like this, right? Well, it doesn't have to be that curve, but as long as you're above the linear curve, you get superlinear speed up. Now, you've got to be very careful when you see superlinear speed up because it could happen uh, due to multiple things. One is uh, well, one is due to unfair comparisons, as you see, but 
The other could be because of cache effects, or memory effects, or working set effects. Basically, as you add more processors, you may be adding more memory into the system also. And if that's the case, you can get super linear speed up because if you had two processors, for example, your working set did not fit in memory, so you used to go to the disk. But if you now have four processors, yes, you're doing more processing, but now your working set also fits in memory, and you're not going to the disk anymore. Now you can get super linear speed up. In fact, once your working set starts fitting in memory, you can get a push in the curve that says, at this point, once my working set starts fitting in memory, I get a jump in the speed up. So you gotta be careful, So, uh, which means that uh, these memory effects can lead to super linear speed up. And I'd like, to encur uh, I'd like you to think about how to actually fairly compare processors. Because adding processors uh, doesn't always need to uh, uh, mean adding more memory. You can keep the memory constant. But then you also generate a bottleneck. So it's important to think about uh, how you evaluate multiprocessors. So basically, your super linear speed up can happen in two ways. Unfair comparisons, as I showed you earlier or memory effects, like this. Now your uh, working set starts fitting in the cache or sitting in the memory, uh, fitting in the memory. Uh, there are some traditional metrics to evaluate processors, utilization, redundancy, and efficiency. And these assume uh, all P processors are tied up for parallel computation. And we're going to look at that, look at this very quickly. Uh, basically, you have P processors, and we assume that you schedule a job that ties up all of those P processors for that particular computation. And uh, multiprocessor is evaluated uh, with three metrics. Oh. Okay. Basically, utilization is how much processing capability is used. And let me actually skip this. You can uh, look at it on your own. Utilization is this, basically. How much processing capability you actually use and how much processing capability you actually tie up. And this example shows uh, what happened with our previous example. Uh, in the previous example, remember, in the parallel version, uh, we had actually uh, 10 of... Uh, 10 operations, and uh, we have three processors, and we tied up three processors uh, for time, uh, five time units. Basically, you have this processing capability of three processors tied up for five, times, five time units. That's 15 units of processing capability tied up, but you're not using all of it. If you look at this uh, slide over here, some parts are not used. If you remember that example from earlier, you can go back in the slides and take a look at that. Uh, you're tying up only 10 out of these 15 uh, uh, potential uh, things, uh, potential uh, processing capability, which means that our utilization is only 66%. OK? Uh, redundancy is how much extra work do we actually do due to multiprocessing? Remember, in the previous algorithm, in the previous polynomial, uh, the, uh, the number of operations uh, that we used uh, with the best algorithm, this is the operations with three processors using the best algorithm, it's 10. With operations with one processor using the best algorithm was eight. So adding more processors actually increased our operations. So our redundancy is actually 10 over eight. Right. Redundancy is always greater than one. R is always greater than or equal to one. Adding, basically doing more uh, processing, uh, parallel processing adds overhead into the system. Well, why uh, actually redundancy can replicate uh, the, uh, as, as you parallelize your program, you can replicate some of the data because you need to feed to multiple processors, right? And you can add more communication operations, even though we didn't have communication over here. If you add more communication operations, then redundancy will even increase. And efficiency, finally, is uh, how much resource uh, we used compared to how much resource we can actually get away with. Well. Uh, what, could, what could we have gotten away with? Basically, with a single processor version, we could have gotten away with tying up one processor for only eight uh, cycles, right? Basically, uh, we, we get away with, uh, we have one processor and we tie it up for uh, eight cycles. In this case, T1 is equal to eight. Whereas with the uh, multiprocessor version, we had three processors and we tied up for five cycles, right? This is actually T3. So we get 8 over 15. That's our efficiency. So we're not very efficient, right? Instead of tying up one processor for 8 cycles, we tied up three processors for 15 cycles. And efficiency is actually uh, the division of utilization and redundancy. And you can take a look at that uh, on your own. OK, let's take a look at caveats of parallelism. And I've already given you this caveat, right? Remember the speed up curve that I've showed you earlier? Uh, you have super linear speed up region. And reality is this diminishing returns. So why do you actually have this diminishing returns? 
Well, MDAL's law. MDAL's law, I briefly discussed that earlier. And I'll strongly encourage you to read MDAL's paper, this paper, Validity of the Single Processing Approach, uh, Single Processor Approach to Achieving Large Scale computer, Computing Capabilities. This was published in AFIPS in 1967. It's only a three page paper, as you see. One, two, well, actually, it's not three, two points, uh, one page paper. And I'll strongly recommend you to read this. It'll be one of your uh, required readings uh, at some point. Uh, basically, MDAL's law says you can only parallelize the parallelizable portion of the program, and the serial portion of the program determines your overall speed up. And hence, you get that curve that uh, shows you diminishing returns. That's the idea. Uh, and this uh, that I show over here, uh, this equation that I show over here, summarizes uh, MDAL's law. You have a parallelizable part uh, of the single processing pro program and the non-parallelizable part. Uh, assuming the parallelizable part is perfectly parallelizable, uh, uh, you can uh, divide that execution time with the number of processors you have, whereas the serial part, that remains. The time actually remains over there. You cannot speed that up. So what does this lead to? What is, what is your speed up equation, uh, uh, the speed up with P processors lead to in that case? Assuming your parallel part is perfectly parallel, speed up with P processors is essentially one divided by the parallelizable part divided by P processors plus the non-parallelizable part. And as P goes to infinity, what happens is your speed up goes to 1 divided by alpha over infinity. And this, uh, this approach is 0, so I'm going to remove this. 1 divided by 1 minus alpha. Right? You all know Amdahl's law, which means that this alpha is really the bottleneck for your speed up. Right? Assuming that this parallelizable portion is perfectly parallelizable, your bottleneck becomes this alpha, which is the serial fraction of the program. Right? And now you can draw curves. What happens to speed up as alpha changes? right? Uh, and let me actually draw these curves. So you, you should read this paper, uh, uh, Amdahl's paper. It's a seminal paper. And when actually Amdahl wrote this paper, uh, his tone was, the single processors are still important because of the serial portion. Serial portion you cannot parallelize, which means that you'd better do something about it if you want to improve performance. Right? And serial portion, he found that in many programs, some data management tasks are actually hard to serialize, uh, hard, hard to parallelize. And these data management tasks actually constitute a significant fraction of the program, like 40%, 50%, which means that the best speed up you can get uh, with uh, infinite number of processors is 2.5 or 2. Right? So he was actually a little bit pessimistic about parallel processing at the, same, at the time. So this is another version of Amdahl's law. It's basically the same thing over here, except I renamed, uh, I guess, alpha. Uh, I guess p remains still. Alpha is now uh, turned to f over here. f is the parallelizable fraction. p is the number of processors. Basically, the takeaway, maximum speed up is limited by the serial portion, and that's the serial bottleneck. And now we could actually draw these curves that I showed you over here. How does speed up change with the number of processors? Well, if you actually draw this curve, you get this diminishing return, uh, as, I see, as, as you can see on the slide. I'm not going to draw this, but basically, the takeaway is adding more and more processors gives less and less benefit if alpha is less than 1. Right? If alpha is 1, then you get uh, linear benefits. But if alpha is less than 1, you get this diminishing return curve. And for different values of alpha, that curve is plotted over here uh, in, this, uh, in this slide. Now you can actually do the other thing. Uh, you can have alpha on the x-axis and speed up on the y-axis. And now this looks like this, right? Which means that the benefit, the speed up, is small until alpha is very close to 1. Right? And this is irrespective of how many processors you add. The benefit is really small because this is really the bottleneck, right? Uh, if alpha is very close to one, then your speed up will be high. But if alpha is not close to one, then uh, the benefit will be low for a long time. And uh, let me show you a, a real example over here. Here we plot the parallel fraction, f, on the x-axis and speed up on the y-axis for different values of processors, in this case n. For n equals 10, n equals 100, n equals 1,000, you see that uh, the performance, the speed up, uh, becomes close to 10. Even with 1,000 processors over here, the speed up becomes uh, 10 only if the parallel fraction of your program is 90%. Basically, parallelizable portion is 90%. And that's a lot. You've got to be able to parallelize 90% of your program perfectly uh, to, get, uh, to, get high per to get very high speed ups. And this is called the sequential bottleneck. Sequential bottleneck 
all parallel machines have the sequential bottling. The part that is not parallelizable determines your speed up. This is actually a general bottleneck equation. Basically, if you're trying to improve a part of your architecture or a part of something, a part of a system, the part you cannot improve really becomes the bottleneck. Right? That determines the benefit you're going to get from the optimization that, that optimizes uh, the other part that you can optimize. Right? The part you cannot optimize becomes your bottleneck. That determines your speed up. That determines the metric, uh, the efficiency me of the met uh, efficiency metric that you're trying to optimize for. Okay, why do we have the sequential bottleneck? Well, uh, if you look at a parallel program, it may look like this. Basically, you may have a single thread spawning jobs and creating jobs, and you have many parallel threads at that time, and then you may have a single thread aggregating results, right? And then it also spawns more jobs, and then these threads execute in parallel, and then that thread again aggregates the results, and so on. When you're executing the single thread, assuming that single thread is not parallelizable, well, you have non-parallelizable operations on data. For example, you have non-parallelizable loops. Or a single thread can prepare data and spawn parallel tasks. This is usually sequential. If that happens, and if, even if that's a small fraction of the time, that becomes your bottleneck. And this is exactly the problem that was faced uh, from the very beginning of parallel processing by designers of vector machines, for example, Cray. And uh, vector machines actually executed code very similar to this. You had serial parts, and you have a almost perfectly parallel part, assuming you do load, it, uh, load balancing very well across different threads. And uh, these machines had the sequential bottleneck. Oh. OK. Another example of the sequential, and we'll take a look at how the Cray is designed very briefly. Another example of the sequential bottleneck is over here. Uh, and I'll let, uh, I'll let you study this. Oh, I guess I'm having problems with my pointer over here. So I'll keep it down over here. Uh, basically, you, you see that the thread actually here, uh, A, the portion of the thread, prepares uh, execution. And this is the ending of the execution. And if this th these take uh, a long time, if the printing of the solution take a long time, or if the spawning of the threads actually take a long time, you have a sequential bottleneck. And uh, we will see that there are actually bottlenecks in the parallel portion as well. Uh, MDOT law actually doesn't cover that, but we'll take a look at that in a second. So what is the implication of MDOT law on design? Basically, this means that uh, your, your performance is limited by uh, the part of the program that you cannot parallelize. So if you really care about performance, maybe you should optimize for that. So this is an example from Cray. This is another paper that I would strongly recommend that you read uh, from Richard Russell, the Cray-1 computer system in Capcom uh, Communications of the ACM in 1978. It has a good description of uh, the Cray-1 processor, including nice pictures of the Cray-1 computer, the cabinets and uh, the modules, as you can see over here, uh, and uh, the summary of characteristics, and actually some of the functional units, how, the, how, how it's programmed, how it operates, and some of the vector uh, techniques, like vector chaining, which we had discussed earlier, which we will discuss a little bit more. But basically, this was this is well known as a fast vector machine. Basically, you can do vector processing with multiple units. Uh, you have eight vector registers, which was very wide at, uh, for its time, and 64 elements in each register. Well, guess what? It was the fastest scalar machine of its time as well. Why? And the reason is because of Andal's law, the sequential bottleneck. Cray designers uh, figured out that the sequential bottleneck actually limited their performance, so they designed the fastest scalar machine such that they could get out of these bottlenecks and uh, execute in vector mode in parallel as much as possible. And I'd uh, recommend that you read this uh, paper. The paper doesn't talk about that as much, of course, but uh, this is uh, that's an anecdote. Okay. Uh, this is one caveat of parallels. We looked at serial or sequential bottleneck. But Andal's law doesn't consider one more thing. Right? Let me draw this over here. Our speed up, remember, was uh, 1 divided by, uh, um, uh, let me call this uh, alpha divided by uh, processors plus 1 minus alpha. In the slide, it's f. f or alpha, you can, you can do renaming dynamically in your head. But this is the parallelizable portion, and this is the non-parallelizable portion. Well, let, this is be covered. It's sequential bottleneck. We've got to fix that problem somehow. And we're going to take a look at solutions to that. This, there's an assumption here, right? This parallel uh, part of the program should be perfectly parallel for you to be able to do this division. Well, guess what? This parallel part of the program is actually not perfectly parallel. And there are three fundamental reasons for this. Uh, and I'd like you to think about what are these fundamental reasons. And I'll pause for a while so that you can think about it. And maybe you can write down the answers on your own and check them later on. OK, pause over. The first is synchronization overhead. You actually have 
potentially updates to shared data, right? You remember, we talked about tightly coupled multi processing, or even, even a loosely coupled multi processing when you need to send and receive data, there's some synchronization that happens, right? And that synchronization leads to serialization. If one thread locks a data structure and another thread is accessing it, well, one thread is actually not dividing the parallel portion, right, uh, by P because one thread is actually serialized. You can actually have, in the end, all threads contending for a critical section, contending for the same lock, and all threads are waiting, and your parallel speed up can be one because of the synchronization overhead. The second is load imbalance overhead. This assumes that all processors are actually perfectly balanced, right? You have this parallel portion, let's say this is the serial portion, and you have this parallel portion, and you have the threads. They all perfectly end at the same time, even if they don't synchronize. Well, guess what? That is not always true. Some threads end early, some threads end late, right? As a result, what you have is this imbalance between threads. And this could happen due to multiple reasons. First, uh, for example, you may have partitioned the data in an imbalanced way. That could be possible, right? The tasks may not be balanced between these threads. Or uh, what might happen is uh, the tasks may be balanced, but some of the operations that happen on the tasks take longer because of the input data dependence, right? I guess imbalanced input set could be one reason. Input dependent operations could be another reason. For example, uh, what might happen is uh, the data that this thread is processing is already sorted, for example. Whereas the data that this present, let's say you're doing sort across a large uh, array of numbers. You've taken this array and divided it into these, let's say, four processors. And this part of the array happens to be sorted. Whereas this part of the array may be totally unsorted. You need to really sort that. In this case, the thread that's assigned this part of the array that's already sorted will take much shorter time to do the sorting. Whereas the thread that's assigned this part of the array even though these two parts may be equal, they may all have one million elements, they may each have one million elements, this thread will take much longer because the, uh, the part of the data happens to be not sorted. This is a case of data dependence, input data dependence. Even though the threads are doing the same operations, even though it's their data sets are the same, this thread much, takes much longer because this part of the array that is assigned happens to be not sorted. So you can get load and imbalance because of this, and programmer may not be able to anticipate that at all, right? OK, and the third reason for imbalance could be, again, microarchitectural characteristics, right? What might happen is one thread may have a, a good cache hit ratio, whereas another thread may have a bad cache hit ratio. The thread that has bad cache hit ratio will take longer, even though everything else may be the same. Well, why could it have a bad cache hit ratio? Maybe the data is a little bit different. Maybe something else is happening. Maybe an interrupt is coming in and kicking out some of these uh, data, right? Something may be happening in the system that leads to the microarchitecture uh, imbalancing, uh, making these threads unbalanced. So this is another important problem. And solving the load imbalance problem uh, is not easy because you've got to load balance at the programmer level. Do you load balance at the architecture level? Do you load balance at the microarchitecture level? So these are all interesting problems. Or do you rebalance at the runtime system level? For example, a programmer can divide the uh, threads into chunks, and you can actually get dynamic chunks, for example. In this case, if the thread uh, is done with its sorting quickly, it can perhaps get another chunk uh, from the array. Of course, assuming that that chunk is not array, uh, th that chunk is, is not assigned to some other thread. This this leads to uh, uh, chunking at a finer grain, dividing this input set at a finer grain, such that the thread quickly figures out if it can process chunk quickly. It can uh, once it's done with its chunk, it can get another chunk. Once it's done its uh, chunk, it can get another chunk. This is basically dynamic tasking. You can actually have dynamic chunking, I should say. Uh, you can assign the inputs in a dynamic way to the threads instead of assigning in a static way. That improves your load imbalance. Uh, also, uh, how do you actually improve it at microarchitecture level? We will see that when we talk about bottleneck identification and scheduling. So the third reason why parallel portion is not perfect, the parallel is the resource sharing overhead. These threads or these cores that are executing may serialize because there may be one shared resource. Let's say this is your main memory. And the two threads are accessing the same bank. 
when one thread is accessing that bank, the other thread has to wait for that thread, uh, wait for that access to finish so that it can compl complete its access. Now, this leads to serialization among the processors, right? And this could become really bad, actually. All processors, again, can be serialized on the same bank. That's why it's important to have a parallel memory for a parallel processor such that different threads can access in parallel the main memory. But this is, this is a tough problem uh, because even if you bank the memory, it may turn out that the threads data are mapped such that they access the same bank. Right? So data mapping becomes an issue. It becomes important to map the data such that threads conflict with each other as little as possible in this shared uh, physical memory. But for these three different reasons, this P is not exactly P. Right? With P processors, you don't divide alpha by P, but you divide alpha by a factor that's much smaller than P. Synchronization, load imbalance, and resource sharing. And if you actually come up with another reason, I'd be very happy to know, because these are really fundamental. So let's take a look at these bottlenecks and parallel portion. Actually, I've already talked about that. Synchronization, operations manipulating shared data cannot be parallelized. And lo uh, you need locks. Uh, you need to protect things with mutual exclusion. And also barrier synchronization. You actually uh, need to synchronize at the barrier. This is also a communication where tasks may need values from each other. This causes thread serialization when shared data is contended, as I showed you earlier. Load imbalance, parallel tasks may have different lengths, as I told you. And this may be due to different reasons, as I discussed. Uh, due to imperfect parallelization or microarchitectural effects, uh, or the input data set effects, as we discussed. This reduces speed up in the parallel portion. And finally, resource contention. Parallel tasks can share hardware resources, delaying each other. Main memory could be one. Caches could be another. Interconnect could be another. And we're going to cover uh, all of these uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, well, you could solve this problem by actually replicating all the resources, but this is very expensive, giving each thread, each task its own resources, but this becomes a very expensive system. Resource sharing in general improves efficiency, and again, that's a fundamental principle. Sharing hardware resources enables more efficient processing. And this leads to resource contention, uh, at least additional latency that's not present when each task actually runs alone. And we will see the effects of the free resource contention uh, on uh, both parallel as well as uh, multi-program uh, program performance. So there's little difficulty in parallel programming. Let's go back uh, to parallel programming a little bit. There's little difficulty if parallelism is natural. You can have embarrassingly parallel applications, and then parallel programming becomes relatively easy, except you still need to deal with some of these uh, effects, resource sharing effects. Uh, for example, multimedia applications, physical simulation, and graphics, they have lots of parallelism. If you're, uh, for example, averaging across a huge image, uh, you, can, you can basically, maybe zooming in to an image, basically you're averaging the cells across, uh, around each cell uh, to be able to, uh, uh, I guess, zoom out in this case. Uh, to, and you could do that in parallel across uh, different images. You have lots of data level parallels. So in this case, parallel, uh, parallel programming is relatively easy. And maybe in large web servers and databases, uh, you can request level parallelism. Although the shared data structures, again, make it harder to do the parallel, uh, par parallel programming here, especially if you want high performance. So if you want high performance, basically, you need to deal with these bottlenecks over here. The big difficulty is in really harder to parallelize algorithms and getting parallel programs to work correctly while you're trying to achieve high performance. Because while you're trying to achieve high performance, you're trying to reduce this uh, serial part, and you're also trying to reduce some of these load imbalance, resource contention, synchronization overheads, which means that you're becoming uh, more and more aggressive in not protecting shared data, and that may lead to bugs. Right? As a result, you get, it may be difficult to write parallel programs that work correctly. And optimizing performance and the presence of these bottlenecks uh, become, become the difficult part. So much of parallel compu uh, computer architecture, as a consequence, is about designing machines that can overcome these sequential and parallel bottlenecks to achieve higher performance and efficiency. And also, because the programmer has a fundamental uh, responsibility in parallelizing the program, unless you do implicit parallelization, uh, we would like to make the programmer's job easier in writing correct and high performance parallel programs. When the programmer uh, actually cannot uh, do very fine grained parallelization, maybe we design systems that can aid the programmer, that can give hooks to the programmer such that that parallelization becomes easier. Maybe the programmer can figure out what's dependent and what's independent with a little bit of feedback from the system. Or maybe the programmer can hint at the system saying, these may be dependent, but I do not know for sure. So maybe you should check a little bit. 
Or maybe the programmer can program with coarser grain locks and we accelerate them underneath uh, in hardware to actually uh, make things run faster uh, for the programmer, even though the programmer couldn't uh, fine grain parallelize the program. So much of parallel computer architecture is about these two things, and we'll take a look at those. So the key question is basically, once you have these parallel uh, serial bottleneck, as well as bottlenecks in the parallel portion, synchronization, uh, load imbalance, and resource contention, how do you alleviate some of these bottlenecks in a multi-core processor? We will return to this question uh, in, the, in the next few lectures. And this is a reading list uh, that I would like to provide. Uh, these are uh, the ideas of heterogeneous multi-core, uh, basically. And uh, you can take a look at uh, these uh, for, for, for the next few lectures. And these are actually very good papers to think about. Uh, potentially, you can do projects in these areas. Let's go back to the bottlenecks in the parallel portion. MDAL's law does not consider these bottlenecks in the parallel portion. One interesting idea is how do you actually uh, model these bottlenecks? How does synchronization, for example, critical sections or barrier uh, synchronization, when, uh, basically in barrier synchronization, all threads need to reach a barrier such that uh, execution can continue before that uh, serialization happens. How do, how do these operations, load imbalance and resource contention, affect parallel speedup? How do we actually come up with an intuitive model like MDAL's law to actually take these factors into account? Can we develop an intuitive model to reason about these such that the programmer can say, oh, this fraction of my program may be, uh, uh, may be within critical sections, and that leads to uh, perhaps this much degradation in speedup that I will get. So this is very interesting. And uh, this is one of the key questions uh, that I would like to pose to you as a potential project idea, especially if you're theoretically oriented and if you would like to do some analysis of real systems and apply theory to this. So this is a research topic, and there are some example papers that I would recommend. Uh, one of them, Ehrman and Ekaut, uh, modeling critical sections in Amdahl's law that was presented in ISCA 2010. They develop a model uh, that looks at critical sections and models them in some way, incorporates them, and they argue for asymmetric multi-core processors to actually accelerate critical sections. And Suleiman Adal's feedback-driven threading uh, model takes into account both bandwidth as well as contention issues uh, in, in figuring out uh, uh, the number of threads that you should use to execute a program. And these are uh, interesting beginning points, but they do not consider the bottlenecks in the parallel portion uh, in a more comprehensive way. And there's a lot of need for actually analysis of critical sections in real programs. So that could be another project uh, as you go along in this course. How do you, uh, can, can we analyze some of these critical pet sections that, uh, that happen in real programs? And can we actually enable such a model through that such analysis? And also this is true for load imbalance as well as resource, resource contention too. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. We've covered a lot in parallel processing basics. Uh, and I would strongly encourage you to do the reading. So in the backup slides, I will go over the readings very quickly. These are the reference readings in this lecture. And please take a look at them. Do as many readings as possible. Uh, that will lead you to do uh, strong projects, hopefully. Okay. I hope you'll, uh, you'll enjoy the question.